Our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Timothy, and you're invited to follow along if you so choose, because the text is printed in your bulletin. Hear these words. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. May God bless our modern hearing of these ancient words. Will you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day. And we ask, O God, that in this time of worship that you would speak either through me or in spite of me, but that above all else we would hear with clarity what it is that you say to us this day. We trust and ask this in your many names. Amen. On Sunday, October 20th, 2013, I preached a candidacy sermon and my first sermon as the candidate to become associate minister of this great church with the same sermon title and the same scripture for this morning. It began this way. Dr. J. Howard Olds tells the story of setting off on a family vacation when his children were young. He writes, it was the middle of the summer we loaded our family in an old station wagon, the one with the wood paneling down the side, and headed to Florida for a vacation. About 10 miles into the trip, we heard the typical chants that parents hear on vacations with children. Are we there yet? How much longer? You know, family, normal family conversations. Then about 50 miles into the trip, our 10-year-old son, Wes, posed a question I can never forget. Dad, when we get where we're going, where will we be? When we get where we're going, where will we be? Well, I won't speak for you, but this is the question in my heart. If invited by you to be your next associate pastor, what will life in Naples, Florida be like for me? What exciting things will we do together to bring about God's preferred future for this great church? And I can imagine some of the questions in your mind. What will it be like to have Dawson as our associate pastor What ideas and gifts does he bring? Will this sermon be any good? (laughs) We all have questions and we all wonder what the future will bring, especially when we enter a crossroads like this. Later that day, 92% of this congregation elected me to be the associate minister. And I formally began my ministry among you on December 1st. 2013. I remember when one of my closest friends and colleagues suggested that I send my profile to this church after he withdrew from the search because he decided that they did not want to leave the congregation that he was serving at the time. So I still give him grief to this day that I was thrilled to be your runner-up. 
I also remember when John Richardson called me to invite me to come to Naples for an interview. John chaired the search committee that brought me here. I was actually sitting in a hotel room preparing to, for an interview uh, to become the conference minister in another state. And as only John can do, he responded, well, when that doesn't work out, call me back. <laughs> I remember my first meal with that search committee at Windermere Country Club and how Pat McGee, may she rest in peace, offered to lead me from the club after dinner that night to my hotel so that I would not get lost. It required about two turns, but I still appreciated it. The week before my candidacy Sunday as associate minister, there were 13 get-to-know-you events. And for those, he was at the earlier service, but for those who know Bill Robinson, he came with a three-inch ring binder full of paper and research and background on me that he had done and asked a question at every single event. To his credit, he was always fair. And I remember being told about how the lay leadership called every parent with a child or youth in our family ministries program to ask how they felt about having an openly gay minister. And just two years later, 98% of you would vote to call me as the sixth senior minister. I still have the ballot in my files where someone voted yes as to my call for senior minister and then signed it, God. <laughs> Don't worry, it didn't get counted. I remember negotiating with Al Olson, who was chairperson of the board of trustees at the time, regarding my compensation as senior minister on a Saturday evening in my office. Although me being 37 years old at the time and Alan being a West Point uh, graduate, I'm not sure there was much negotiation on my part. My predecessor, Reverend Dr. Ron Patterson, told me as I began to transition into this role that one of the most difficult parts of this job is being pastor to so many people that you care so deeply about and then having to bury them. I always believe and trust Ron but I did not understand his words until I stepped into this role. It is impossible to speak to the collective grief that pastors carry. As I think about the well over 100 memorial services that I have officiated during my tenure, and that doesn't count the services of Angela, Deb, Sharon, David, and others. Many of you may remember that my first summer as senior minister, we remodeled the sanctuary and resurfaced the parking lot. That summer, we remained at two worship services in McSpadden Hall. Formerly, there was metal railing around most of the chancel, and it was always exciting on the chancel because the wooden flooring had started to give way, and so you would be walking along and suddenly feel the floor give way. And so you always wondered if you might end up going through the floor during part of the worship service. We decided that there, were, there was one too many chandeliers for the room, and so we decided that one needed to be removed. And then we replaced all of the lighting with LED lighting, keeping the original chandeliers. Somehow, though, that got miscommunicated, and the rumor began that we were removing every chandelier from the room. And so at Bargain Box, there began a keep the chandeliers campaign. <laughs> and I'm fairly confident that was the first fire I had to put out 
by going to Bargain Box and explaining what we were doing with the sanctuary lighting. I remember the day that David Heinemann, who was chairing the board of mission and outreach at the time, came into my office to tell me how lucky we would be to give away $80,000 to the neighborhood health clinic. Few people understand the pressures on pastors as fundraisers. So I was struggling with the idea that we would be so lucky to give away so much money. Well, I soon began to see the energy and excitement that it created as we began to raise money for a dental suite at the neighborhood health clinic especially once we exceeded our goal by 50% and the lifelong friendship that I developed with Nancy Lashide, the clinic's co-founder. Or the day that I was notified shortly after Ken Bruce's death about the estate gift that he had left earmarked for Habitat for Humanity. We dreamed of multiplying that gift by 10 or the cost of five homes. Instead, you astounded me and the community by turning it into more than $400,000 or the cost of eight homes. It was truly a miracle in the making over about a six-week time period. And then I remember as COVID began to hit our community and the countless meetings where I sat with our lay leadership and we made the painful decision to shutter this church. And with tears in my eyes, telling the staff that they needed to go home and work remotely, but that I had faith that we would surely be back by Easter. And as I often explain, I was right, but off by a year. (laughs) But you cannot imagine in a congregation of 1,200 how we had more than 3,000 different opinions about whether or not we should be back together in person. But I do remember the joy of Easter Sunday at Artist Naples as we gathered again for the first time. And I remember the joy of sitting with our leadership and our staff as we dreamed about the ability to connect our congregation while shuttered as we took a leap of faith and invested in our technology and our abilities so that everyone could remain connected while socially and physically distant. As someone said after the nine o'clock service, You know, if you went through the whole list, we'd still be in there. (laughs) That day in October of 2013, I ended my sermon this way. Because at the end of the day, this is where our faith must guide us. We must be reminded that somehow in the midst of this world, God is at work. And God is guiding our steps. Trust me, I am more confident of that today than I ever have been before. I know that even in the uncertainty of our questions, our doubts, and our fears, as we gather today to worship the one who guides our steps, and brings the fullness of the realm of God to this earth, we know and can trust where God is leading. So when we get where we are going, where will we be? I can say with all faith, 
I'm not sure. But I trust God. And I trust you. Amen.